After we've read the Old Testament and then we begin reading the New Testament, we find that there's an entirely different environment in the New Testament than there was in the Old. When we set the Old Testament aside, finished reading it, we found that the people were returning from Babylonian exile and they were very poor. And the city of Jerusalem was not the grand city that they had once known. But then when we pick up the New Testament and begin reading it, we find the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We have the synagogue. Now we have a magnificent temple. We have Roman rulers. And people stop and wonder, what happened to bring all of this about? Well, there's a period called the intertestamental period. That's very important to every Bible student. Because in the intertestamental period, we find out that there were a number of historical things that took place that directly affected the, the environment of the New Testament. For example, the background of the Old Testament, beginning back in the days of the uh, United Kingdom, that background has completely changed by the time we come to the New Testament. To understand the New Testament, we need to understand both its Old Testament background and also the background of the intertestamental period to see what kind of atmosphere and what kind of environment we're really talking about when we read about Jesus and the apostles and the coming of the, the Lord's church. When we think about the United Kingdom of Israel, for example, we think of Saul, David, and Solomon, the three kings of the United Kingdom. Well, you remember at the end of Solomon's reign that the kingdom divided, and now we have a kingdom to the north and another kingdom to the south. The kingdom to the north was referred to as the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom to the south was referred to as the kingdom of Judah. Well, what happened during this divided kingdom period turned out to be a very, very important thing as we read the Old Testament. You'd be surprised, though. That also turned out to be an important thing when we begin reading the New Testament. Let's say just a word now about the kingdom of Israel. Oh, in a lot of ways, the kingdom of Israel was a real disaster. They had only a just one king that could really be thought of as a, a great king, and that was Jehu. The rest of the kings of Israel were very, very evil, wicked men. Over and over, the prophets warned them that they had better turn back to God. If they did not turn back to God, God would see to it that they were taken into captivity. Well, unfortunately, just like things are today, People didn't care to listen to the Lord because the Lord had too many rules and regulations for them. They didn't care to listen to the Lord because they wanted to live life the way they wanted to live it. And surely enough, they lost their nation. The Assyrian Empire came in and conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And those people were taken into what we call uh, the Assyrian captivity. They dispersed these people, the Jews, the, the Hebrews, they dispersed them all over the world. And that broke down their sense of loyalty because they married outside of the country of Palestine. And then when they thought about going back to Palestine, maybe a wife wanted to come, but the husband is from a different part of the world. And so there were many, many troubles that arose because of this. It was in 722 that the northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity to the people of, uh, of uh, Assyria. A man by the name of Shalmaneser, Shalmaneser V. He was the king of Assyria at this time, and in 722 he led his army into the area of Palestine. He laid siege to, the, to Samaria, the capital of the uh, northern kingdom of Israel, and he captured that, uh, that kingdom. A man by the name of Sargon is a man who actually concluded that siege, though. We don't know exactly the details, but it seems that Shalmaneser was either killed 
or something happened because he is no longer king by the time that this uh, final uh, capture of the city of Samaria took place. Sargon II was not known until uh, we read the book of Isaiah, and then he's mentioned only one time. But back in the 1800s, there was a great archaeological discovery made, and they uncovered the annals of Sargon, a king of Assyria that they never knew existed, except that he was mentioned one time in the Bible. And now we know a whole lot about this man, Sargon. We find out that Sargon was, uh, was one of the great kings of the Assyrian Empire. We know a lot about what took place during his uh, kingship. Well, during the divided kingdom uh, period, there was a southern kingdom as well, better known as the kingdom of Judah. So we have the north, the kingdom of Israel, and the south, the kingdom of Judah. Some interesting things happened during the time of the kingdom of Judah. For example, Sennacherib, who was the king of uh, uh, Assyria, the Assyrian Empire at this time, he decided he would come down and lay siege to Jerusalem. He did that, and he threatened Jerusalem to that he would destroy them. But he took off and went down to Lachish, and, and he had a battle down there, and he destroyed the city of Lachish. But he thought that surely he had everything sewed up so that he would be able to take the city of Jerusalem. Well, when he got back, the Lord intervened, and the army of Sennacherib thought that there was a great plague that had come to them, and they up and left. But on the uh, prism of, of Sennacherib, uh, we have a statement that he thought he really had uh, the, the people of Judah sewed up. And he says, Judah is like a bird in a cage to me. Well, it didn't work out that way. Uh, the kingdom of the Assyrians was a, an enormous uh, empire. We can see it here in the purple. And they were ruthless people. They were people who went all over the place giving all sorts of trouble. The Assyrian Empire was a very powerful empire, and the people of the Assyrian Empire were ruthless as they could be. They have gone down in history as some of the most ruthless people in the entire history of the world. But let's go back now and take a look at the a kingdom of Judah, the kingdom to the south. The Assyrians were finally put out of business. And in the year 612 BC, uh, Nebuchadnezzar went in and destroyed the city of Nineveh, the capital of the uh, Assyrian Empire. For all practical purposes, that was the end of the Assyrian Empire. And that was also the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar was a very ambitious man, and Nebuchadnezzar was a great warrior in his time. And he led many, uh, many uh, campaigns in which he destroyed or he captured many of the people who were around him. Here we have the ruins of the old Ishtar Gate in Babylon. Babylon enjoyed being one of the grandest cities in the entire world maybe the grandest at that time, and Nebuchadnezzar had his mind set on making it a, an example to the whole world of how powerful he was and how wealthy he was and what he could do. Well, here's some more ruins of the Ishtar Gate, and you'll see that in the just barely in the background there, there are animals that appear in the, uh, in the brickwork of the Ishtar Gate. Here is an artist's rendition of what the Ishtar Gate apparently looked like. We do know from other descriptions pretty much what this area looked like, and the Ishtar Gate probably was just about like this. In the front of the Ishtar Gate, leading into the gate, is the old processional way where they had many of their ceremonial uh, events. Over in the city of Berlin, there is a very, very interesting reconstruction of the Ishtar Gate. And what you see here is somewhat what the Ishtar Gate looked like. 
The purple and the blue and the various colors are very real because this is the way the uh, people of Babylon had conceived of this. And they built animals right into the brickwork. And these animals were variously covered. And then also there is the hanging gardens of uh, ba Babylon. It's kind of a peculiar thing because although they're spoken of in history, nobody really knows anything much about the hanging gardens. And some archaeologists have actually wondered if there was ever any such thing as the Babylonian hanging gardens. The Hanging Gardens have been uh, variously imagined by a number of artists from descriptions that we have. Nobody really knows what it looks like, like I said, but at the same time, the Hanging Gardens have been reproduced by a number of artists according to their own imagination. Right in the center of the old city of Babylon, there was a big lion. Nobody knows exactly what the significance of this big lion was, but there he was, right there in the city. One of the most important archaeological discoveries of the 18 and 1900s had to do with the city of Babylon. And one of these was the Babylonian Chronicle. From the Babylonian Chronicle, we get information about a whole lot of things that happened in the Babylonian, during the Babylonian Empire. And one of those very important things was that information is given about the uh, ex exile of the Jewish people when Nebuchadnezzar came in and he captured the city of Jerusalem. And then there also is the Elephantine Papyrus. You see, when Nebuchadnezzar was threatening the uh, city of Jerusalem and the whole area of Judah, some of the people became worried and thought they'd be safer for them to go down to Egypt than it would for them to go to Babylon. And so some of them kidnapped the prophet Jeremiah, who had warned against this, but they took him to Babylon. They settled on a little island in the lower part of the uh, Nile River, and that island was called the Island of Elephantine. They wrote some things and told something about the various experiences that they had. All the Jews fled down there and they ended up building for themselves a, a, a temple of their own. It was not like anything like the temple in Jerusalem, but it did serve as kind of a place of reminder and a place of some sort of worship for the Jews who were down there in Elephantine. And then we also have what's called the Nippur tra uh, tablets. In 1948 to 1958, about 30 or 40,000 tablets written in the cuneiform script were discovered and also some things called the Babylonian creation epic were also found. These things have lent great knowledge to us as we study uh, the, the history of Babylon uh, it's ancient history and it's even uh, history at the time of the Babylonian exile. Well, Babylon didn't last but about 66 years altogether and there were troubles with the Babylonians. The Persian people who lived to the uh, east of Babylon uh, went up north and then they came down on Babylon and began giving it trouble. Uh, what they really did was that they diverted the Euphrates River just a little bit, and Belshazzar, who was the acting king at that time in the place of his father, uh, Belshazzar had given a sort of a drunken feast, and all of a sudden he saw handwriting on the wall, and he didn't know how to read it, and they got Daniel to come and read that handwriting on the wall. And the account of this is found in the book of Daniel. And Daniel said, Belshazzar, the message says your days are numbered, that your kingdom is going to come to an end. And surely enough, that night, the Persians walked into Babylon. They were not even opposed. The people of Babylon were so discouraged and demoralized because of the neglect of the Babylonian government that they actually welcomed the Persians. They were glad to have the Persians there. And so now we begin a new empire, and that is the Persian Empire. 
The Persians conquered the Babylonian Empire about 539, and they began their own conquest. Well, the Persians had a different idea about what to do with captive people than the Babylonians did. You see, the Babylonians wanted to bring captives into their own country to build up their own country. And then the people who were left, they wanted to tax them to help pay for all of the grand uh, developments that were coming along in the city of Babylon. But when Cyrus and the uh, Persians uh, finally conquered Babylon, their idea was, let's send all of these captives back home so that they can build up their own countries, they'll make money, and they'll be able to send taxes in the, to our own country for us. And so the Babylonians now were replaced by the, uh, by the Persians. All the Persians were very ambitious people, and they began looking all over the place to see where they could really go and expand their empire. So they expanded their empire on over toward the Mediterranean Sea, and they expanded their empire over into modern-day Turkey and completely conquered that entire area. The king who was the king of Persians at the time of the conquest of Babylon was a man by the name of Cyrus. Cyrus was a very, uh, very uh, important king, and this cylinder that you see, which is now at the British Museum in London, England, this cylinder was written uh, in the name of Cyrus, and it tells all sorts of things about what Cyrus did and some of the exploits of his kingdom. Well, Cyrus went ahead and he conquered everything all the way over to the Mediterranean Sea. And then Cyrus went on down and he also conquered things uh, through Turkey, modern-day Turkey. Well, there's, he, was, he was a big builder himself. Uh, Darius, his successor, built a great place, a great palace, and a great place over in the city of Persepolis. It was founded in 522 by Darius the Great, but something else happened because Alexander the Great rose up and Alexander the Great in 331 destroyed that magnificent palace of Persepolis. Well, Persepolis, the ruins of Persepolis are still with us and we can see many, many things that took place there in Persepolis. If you'll notice the man standing to your right beside these great big uh, lions that are, uh, and the animals that are guarding this palace, you'll see something about just how big that palace really was there in the city of Persepolis. Well, as we mentioned, it was because of the Persians that the Jewish people were able to come back to Judea and once again occupy their land. They did this at about 538 B.C. It was during this Persian period that the Jews were allowed to go back to their country, as we mentioned a moment ago. They did so under the leadership of various men, one of whom was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel went over there and he began trying to rebuild the temple that had been completely destroyed there by, uh, by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Zerubbabel was followed by a man named Ezra. Actually, they were coexistent uh, for a short period of time. Uh, Ezra began working toward restoring a respect for the law, and he taught the people the law very, very, uh, very, very effectively. And the people decided that because they had left God and left the law, that was the reason for their Babylonian exile. And they emerged with a very great respect then for the law. It was during this restoration period that Nehemiah came back and he helped rebuild the walls and he organized the people to do all kinds of work in the rebuilding of the walls. Well, there's something else that was taking place there. You remember when the Jewish people finally uh, were taken into Babylonian captivity that some of them were left there in the, um, in the old land. And then there were people who were 
placed there by the Assyrians prior to this time, and the, the Jews who were left in the land intermarried with many of these people, and now you have a, a kind of a mongrel race of people, they thought. A race of people that were not true Jews because they had intermarried with non-Jews. And these people settled in an area called Samaria, right there just north of Judah, and they became known as the Samaritans. And when we come to the New Testament, we find that the Samaritans are a prominent group of people. The post-exilic Jewish nation was quite different from the nation uh, that was there before the exile. You see, the, the Jews had learned some lessons during the exile. Uh, it was a terrible time for most of them. Some of them had businesses and some of them were very successful. But there's so many of these people that were abused and, and, and neglected. And they had a very difficult and miserable time during this exilic period. Well, when they came back, they were dedicated to a study of the law, more so than ever before, and the law became very, very important to them. They wanted to teach the children the law. They wanted to teach other people the law, and they even divided into various groups uh, who had different attitudes, really, toward the law. Well, during this time, the, the synagogue is, came into existence. Oh, by the way, when we open the New Testament, you know, we have the synagogue right there. Well, the synagogue was not a place of sacrifice like the temple was, but instead it was a place of learning. It was a place of worship, a place of, of devotion. Most of the synagogues had schools connected with them, and that's where they trained a good many of their children. So the rise of the synagogue was a an intertestamental uh, event and very, very important for these people. You remember a moment ago I said something about the, uh, the Elephantine colony? Well, the Elephantine colony was very loyal to uh, Jerusalem. And when they would do something or get ready to do something, many times they would contact the high priest in Jerusalem. Well, the high priest began gaining not only uh, religious power, but he gained political power as well because the Greek Empire and the Persian Empire that pre uh, uh, preceded them, they looked at the high priest as kind of the political leader of the people as well. And so the high priest's office became a very important office so far as the conquerors were concerned. So when the people of the Elephantine colony were thinking about building a temple, they got permission from the high priest to do so. And so we have some of the information there. Well, the Samaritans, when the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity, the Samaritans were there and they said, oh, we worship the same God that you worship. Well, the Jews said, not really. You see, they had polluted that worship so deeply with some of the pagan customs that their uh, marriage partners uh, were observing that uh, the Jews said, no, we don't want you to help us. We will do this whole thing all by ourselves. Well, about this time, around 382, there was a man in Greece by the name of Philip. He's called Philip of Macedon. Philip of Macedon grew up to be a great warrior. He recognized that the Persians, who were just across the gulf there, the Persians were a great threat to Greece because the Persians occupied all of Turkey, and of course Greece is right across of the gulf there from Turkey. And so Philip of Macedon began organizing the city-states of Greece, and he organized all of them except one. And uh, his idea was that he would go over across the uh, Hellespont and he would drive out the Persians. Well, unfortunate for Philip of Macedon, uh, he, he died. Uh, he was killed. Well, he had a son, and his son was Alexander the Great. And Philip of Macedon, a famous man, 
a courageous man, had to turn the reins of power over to his son, Alexander.